This is Dave Snowden. I've got various titles ranging from Professor at a Complexity Center to Professional Curmudgeon, and I'm not too much fresh which you use. And this is the Agile Uprising podcast. Hello, welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. I'm Andy Clef, and I'm joined today by Professor Dave Snowden. Welcome, sir. Hi. Snowden's an author of many publications on the Kinefin framework, as well as on the development of narrative as a research method and the role of complexity in sense making. Among these topics, uh, we're going to try to cover some additional ground, maybe physics, philosophy, the uh, coffee alcohol cycle, <laughs> cognitive biases, and if agile has gone astray. But, but first, I want, to, I want to invite you, Professor, to give us a short lecture. Some of our listeners may be aware of the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony, where they invite some of the world's top thinkers to, to tell the audience what they're thinking about. And, and each lecturer explains their topic twice. First, a complete technical description in 24 seconds. And then second, a clear summary that anybody could understand in seven words. So, Professor, pick your lecture format and describe for our listening audience, Kinefin. Okay, complexity is the science of inherent uncertainty, the science of systems where you can only understand a dispositional state, but you can't produce a linear relationship between cause and effect. So you have to manage the present rather than trying to manage to a future. Sweet. Okay, then you want the seven word? Yeah, seven words. Think about a children's party. It's complex. <laughs> I love it. And, and that rolls right into storytelling, right? Narrative as a way of explaining situations, passing information along. And, and in the course of our history, we've, we've sung stories. We tell them around campfires. Um, we paint them on cave walls. We, we eventually drew them on clay pots and wove them into tapestries. And, and today we write them down and put them in freaking Jira. You have a background in narrative as a research method. How did how did it come to be for you? Uh, it was when we were working in the field of knowledge management, which was going through the same sort of hype cycle as Agile is at the moment. Um, and we kind of like didn't buy into the concept that you could write everything you knew, put it on a database, and then magically you had a knowledge organization. That was just crap. So we started to try and map what it is people knew and particularly focus on what was known as tacit knowledge, stuff which is about experience, natural talent, heuristics. And the only way to do that was to really identify when people use knowledge. So we started to map decisions. Uh, we found the best way to map decisions was to actually get people to tell stories. So we approached narrative primarily from a research methodology rather than from the communication methodology, and that proved quite useful. I think subsequently we really focus these days on micro narratives and micro observations rather than stories. So stories and storytelling tends to be a performance art. On a day-to-day -day basis, very few people tell stories. They recount anecdotes. They record observations. It's, it's much more fragmented. But that's the origin is. Knowledge mapping, decision support. And then the big area which really drove it forward was um, post and pre-9-11 working with DARPA on what's called human terrain mapping, i.e. understanding the street stories which determine whether people will give home to terrorism or not. And that's extended into since into health, social services, and all sorts of other areas. I'm curious, is there science that indicates our, our brains respond in a different way, either become more active or more engaged when we either hear or tell a narrative? I think it's a, well, it's a complex issue, so I see with a degree of irony. I mean, we, we talk these days about um, homo faber, homo deludens, and homo narrans, yeah, uh, rather than homo sapiens. So we're tool makers and users, we're jokers, we're storytellers. The way narrative works is it works at a level of abstraction. And we know that abstraction in the form of art comes before language in humans. So painting and music comes before language. So our language evolved from imagery. Uh, which gives us huge inventive power because if I'm going to the opera tonight, all right, I have some of my best ideas during the opera because my brain moves on to a different plane, so I make novel connections. And we now know that's the evolutionary advantage of art. Yeah? So narrative is another form of abstraction. It carries enough ambiguity, it can convey meaning without precision, and that's critical to human understanding. 
I love that idea of an evolutionary power of art. Beautiful. So you also have background in physics and philosophy. Yeah, I did a joint honors at university. It was an indulgence when I did it, but it's proved useful since because it's the foundation disciplines in the sciences and the arts. I know the mathematicians disagree on that, but they'll have to live with it. Yeah. <laughs> they can have their own arguments. Um, how does that connect and, and weave together your work with complexity science, physics, philosophy, narrative? Well, complexity is partly physics, although I'm probably more anthropology these days than the biological end of anthropology. I think if you, are, if you do primary disciplines in the arts and the sciences, it teaches you that both are vital. And the general approach I take is a science-based approach. So that's within the naturalizing tradition of philosophy. Mm. So I don't buy the concept that you can use cases to understand what's happening because there's inherent bias in any case-based approach and it's limited in sample size. A physicist wouldn't, would never accept the sort of sample sizes that social sciences do to form any conclusions. Yeah. So the approach we developed is to look at what we know about cognition from cognitive science, what we know about systems from physics, biology, and use that as a natural constraint from which you develop methods and approaches um, to social systems. So really, we take a science-based approach and a quantitative approach in what has traditionally been a qualitative domain. And you mentioned cognitive biases, and you know, at last count, um, Wikipedia lists 188 or so of them. How how do we deal with that in this approach? You you described a, a wonderful experiment. I think it was radiologists and the invisible gorilla um, hidden that only a few saw, and it, it reveals the the biases. You get you give a bunch of radiologists some X rays, and you put a picture of a gorilla in plain sight, which is forty eight times the size of a cancer nodule. Yeah. And 83% don't see it, even though their eyes scan it. And the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the other 83%. And that's called inattentional bias. Um, and it's the killer punch for anybody who thinks they can go and study 10 or 15 companies and draw conclusions from it. You can't. Or in Agile, go and try and reflect on what you did in your last three projects, which you partially completed, and create a certification scheme from it. Yeah, that's even worse. So the essence of that is to live with it, not try and, you can't stop it. It's part of what we are to be human. We're very poor at making decisions individually, but we're quite good at making decisions in clans and families and tribes. So for example, some of our work is to present complex, complex infographics to thousands of people, get them to interpret it in real time. And then we found the outlier clusters, i.e. the 17%. And we go and talk with them before they talk with the 83%. So the science-based approach says live with reality. Don't try and pretend it doesn't exist. Don't try and create a happiness consultancy or a method based on three cases you did last week. But build methods based on what we know are the opportunities and the restraints of natural science. And cognitive science basically says don't trust an individual. Yeah, you have to trust people collectively from diverse backgrounds. So the, the outliers and the wisdom of those outliers, how are they not individuals? Do you, do you, you collect them and you say there's something interesting here, that 17%? Well, for example, we just did one on Korea recently, right? So we presented effectively like a journalist account of the current political situation in Korea. This was a few months back where we all thought Trump might be about to use neutron bombs. Yeah. yeah. So we got people from the BBC foreign correspondents, from foresight specialists, from government departments to effectively interpret that infographic, which was deliberately ambiguous, onto a series of triangles. This is a method we developed and patented, which increases cognitive load to the point where you switch um, cognitive styles. So each triangle has three labels on it, each of which is positive, so nobody knows what the right answer is. So effectively, a thousand people in the same half hour period place this infographic onto six triangles. And from that, we draw what's called a fitness landscape in complexity theory. Um, comes originally from Kaufman, who got it from evolutionary biology, which basically is like a contour map. So dense contours indicate strong opinions and small clusters of contours indicate minority views. So you ignore a single outlier, but if you get a cluster of outliers, then that's significant. Got it. And there's some wisdom in it. It's look here and see what's going on. We now offer that to companies. So an executive can, you know, they build a panel of their staff. They can throw together an infographic. They can identify which panel they want. They can have a result pack in half an hour and they can find who in their company is thinking differently. And that's critical, you know, also both to handle threat, but also opportunity.
And and what scale? What, uh, how many data points? Or what's the minimum? Two or three hundred is more than enough, actually. But we but the nice thing about this is it's scale free in a sense, like most complexity. Yeah. And it, coming back, it it is actually partly fractal. We're seeing that provided you go over a critical volume, there's not a huge amount of difference between small and large volumes because you're working at the right level of granularity. But the validation is important. So, for example. Peace and reconciliation work, if you get a few million people to interpret something, then your credibility when you present what possibilities are available against the idealists is, is much higher. I want to touch a little bit, now a lot, on scaling agile methods, frameworks, and mm -hmm. some of the thinking that you've done around the problems with these recipes that some of the communities is putting out there. Let's Let's start with... Your definition of a method versus your definition of a framework, there seems to be a lot of confusion. And well, I'm just going with a dictionary definition. The fact that the Scrum Alliance wants to ignore it is their affair. A method is a way of doing things. It's a, it's a series of recipes, a series of processes you go to to achieve a type of result. That's a method, yeah, very valuable. Yeah? A framework is a way of looking at the total space. So it doesn't mandate an approach. It creates a method by which you look at the space right? and, and creates multiple methods. But the framework is a way of gaining multiple perspectives. So in the world of creative knowledge development, software development, product development, what's the problem with recipes? Uh, there's no problem in recipe if you're dealing with no need. Yeah. So, for example, let's take Scrum. Scrum is an extremely valuable technique. Yeah. Um, well developed, well enforced, um, works really well for short life cycle developments with high degrees of customer interaction against partially known needs. Yeah. Um, so it's a way of making the complex complicated, of creating stability so that you can scale. And it's a big tick in the box on that. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong with recipes if you're into large scale infrastructure development. I mean, Scrum is actually very weak on eight, nine, 12 month projects, which haven't got customer interaction, but which provide base level architecture. And you can get some nonsense. Like I was working with some guys in Telstra um, who are on waterfall projects because that's what they do, but nobody gets promoted if they're not agile. So they decided to create one year sprints so they could appear to be agile. <laughs> we get a lot of that sort of nonsense, yeah? Um, so, and the point about the method, the method works in a context, right? We're developing a series of what we call pre-scrum techniques within Agile. So ones which deal with much higher levels of ambiguity and even shorter cycle times. And the way you scale a complex system is not by aggregating something which you already exist. So you can't, for example, create a scrum of scrums, although that's one intention. Or you can't throw everything into a big engineering diagram, which was ill-intentioned and that's safe. Yeah? You basically scale by decomposition and recombination. And that's just one-on-one -on -one science. So in a complex adaptive system, you scale by decomposition and recombination. You don't scale by aggregation or repetition. And that changes the game. And, and then you can deal with that and to unanticipated needs and the, the ambiguity that emerges. And that's the key thing, all right? Because technology is advancing faster than users know want to ask, what, know want to ask for. And even when I was writing code back in the 90s, you know, we had a saying is users... You know, never. You can prove they ask for something, but they don't want it when you give it them. They want something different. The real is when you give it them, they realize what they should have asked for. So I think a large part of the problem of techniques like agile, we still have a high failure rate, right? Is they don't pay enough attention to what's called the co-evolution of technology capability with an articulated needs. And if out of that you can realize possibilities, then they can go into things like Scrum. I heard in one of your lectures uh, a method for introducing novelty and innovation that was fascinating, the triple eight method. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, you unpack that for our listening audience? 20 years ago, I invented that. Um, basically, what you do is you run a, a, a RAD team, and a lot of the Scrum people have forgotten about RAD and JAD, which is a pity, right? So, sorry, you run the JAD session, Joint Application Design. And one of the interesting things I found when I was building these methods, this was at the time of the formation of the SDM consortium, was that proto good prototypers are poor coders on, on production systems. It's almost, it's like sales consultants aren't the same thing as consultants. But either way, over an eight hour period, you get users together with you know, high quality prototyping technical specialists and 
we sometimes set up indirect, we often say have a biologist there or an anthropologist, somebody who thought about the problem differently to throw in ideas. That's called a naive asset. And in the eight hours, we'd have a series of prototypes. Yeah? Um, now, that process itself, by bringing in naivety, is novel in its own right. So we do that in London. We then throw the prototype to a team, say, in Mumbai, and say, what can you do with this? And we wouldn't give them access to the original requirement. So they had eight hours to play with it, and then they carry it over to teams, say, in Silicon Valley. They play with it for eight hours and come back. And every time we ran it, users said, God, I wouldn't have thought of that. Could, could I please have it? Yeah. So it, it's using a basic biological principle. Under periods of stress, mutation rates increase because mutation increases resilience and adaptability. So that's what we did. We just increased mutation. Oh, that's fantastic. And that's a 24-hour cycle, very low cost. Yeah, Unfortunately, you know what I've seen in my travels is we code the prototype. the uh, The user says that's great. We send it to production, <laughs> and then six months later, we're like, "How is this thing still running?" Yeah, and I think the other problem, to be honest, is people don't realize prototypes are meant to be disposed of, not made into production systems. Yeah, that's one problem. I think the other problem is the big challenge facing agile at the moment in IT is to rethink the whole concept of architecture. So we're still playing around with TOGAF and TOGAF alternatives, and they all produce engineering diagrams. We need to start to think about architecture in the way that we design complex ecosystems like national parks, for as long as you still have them in America. Because basically, in an ecosystem, you've you've got to create a system which has adaptability and change, and you can't afford, for example, for a trophic cascade when you remove something which operated in the environment in a way which you didn't realize. And that's very frequent when you put new IT systems in. You, you fail to realize the way the old systems work. You have a wonderful example that, that I came across separate and heard you mention it. And it's you, and you, <laughs> you reminded me of it when you talked about whatever national parks we have left. It's when the Park Service introduced maybe two packs of wolves. One pack. Only took one pack. One pack, maybe 10, 10 wolves in Yellowstone. And the water ran clear. It changed the rivers. Mm. And, and it's just... Um, I'll put a link to one of the videos on that. It's a short video, and it was fascinating uh, and a beautiful illustration of both trophic cascades and apex predator theory and... And unintended consequences. Unintended consequences, right? One of the big things you see with engineering approaches to companies is that people remove things because they don't see the purpose. Then you get a trophic cascade. Uh, we had it with the removal of a role in British hospitals called the matron, who was a senior nurse. And they kind of like picked up, they were like a staff sergeant in the army. They picked up on all the pieces the other systems didn't pick up on, but they didn't know what they did. They couldn't explain it to consultants, so they were removed. And then we got a massive issue with hospital hygiene and everything else and resilience. Quite interestingly, they didn't remove the role in Northern Ireland because it was the height of the troubles. And everybody could see what the matron was doing because they were holding the system together. But they removed them in mainland England. And again, IT people, partly because they tend towards the Aspergers end of the spectrum and partly because they tend to be engineers, yeah? They keep designing for how they think systems should be rather than designing from the reality of how people are. And that's one of the big switches we've got to make. Yeah, and then in retrospect, you can look back at the hospital and unwind the cause and effect. It's too late then, because, you I mean, the matron role evolved over 150 years. It was based on a 20, 30-year practice. So you can't reinstate that. Um, right. Interesting, the biological side, we reintroduced beaver um, and lynx into Northumbria in the UK. Um, because people are afraid of wolves for reasons anybody with any knowledge of animal husbandry shouldn't worry about. But again, that's having the same difference. In business, it's critical. If the apex predator starts to fail, and you see this with commodification, there's an opportunity to introduce something new. So in the moment, the agile market is becoming highly commodified. Uh, That means you get less variety in the system. That means the apex predator is going to fall. That means there's a space for novelty. And there's a whole body of theory and practice around this in terms of strategy. Well, the May 2018 HBR issue has Scaling Agile on the cover. Um, is, is that the, the death of it? I think you see in two things. I mean, one is, I mean, if you go down the sequence, right, something, I mean, SAFE was just a cynical market employee to get in accreditation revenue. Um, it, it's validated by good people making it work despite the method, not because of it. Yeah? 
less was more was less ambitious and saw things as choose things select things so that's closer to complexity um uh, scott ambler's stuff which hasn't had the same adoption was even closer but none of them quite got it right because what they were trying to do is to take an existing practice and aggregate it. What we're now seeing is attempts to scale Agile by replicating, for example, Scrum in marketing and HR departments. And just as Agile doesn't work for large technical infrastructure projects in IT, it doesn't really work for corporate strategy. It works for very defined aspects of it. So we got, to my mind, two false attempts at scaling. One is by mass aggregation into, into consolidated engineering systems. The other is by attempting to take something from a specific context in IT to a general context in the business. Yeah? And those are doomed to fail at various levels. Levels. I think the key thing is to break things down and see what the right components are, then reassemble. So let's give an example within IT. Right? Kanban, as most people understand it, is actually a complicated method. It's not complex because it reduces things to a series of cards and you move the cards around between progress tables. Now, the real important thing about Kanban is not the representation that people get obsessed with that. It's actually the concept of dynamic work in progress. So if you say, how do we represent dynamic work in progress in a complicated domain? Well, yes, you do it with cards. In a complex domain, you can't use cards because they're too structured to use fitness landscapes. So you see what I've done. I've decomposed to the essential and I've reapplied it within the context of different systems. Then it will scale. And some of the stuff we're working on at the moment is to link fitness landscapes in with Kanban boards, linking SenseMaker and Scrum Do is one of the areas we're looking at, so that you can effectively create something which handles work in progress across across a diverse ontological range without excessive excessive constraints. Tell me more about fitness landscapes, because that's a new term and, and concept. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of ways to explain it. In this context, the key, and we've done a lot of adaptation on them, so we sometimes call them micro-narrative landscapes, yeah? Basically, they represent fitness, i.e. the degree to which something can cross, say, a species boundary. So the best way we found to represent them is two-dimensional contour maps, because people get that as an image, right? right? So if I've got a shallow set of contours, it means things can escape quite easily. If it's shallow leading to a deep center, then things will fall in accidentally, then get sucked in, and they won't escape. If I've got small outliers, then if I increase their energy, they'll start to pull things towards them and against the dominant attractor. So what they do is they represent the dispositional space of the system. They say, this is how the system is currently disposed. These are the possible areas where it could be disposed. These are the outlier events. In some cases, what we call adjacent possibles. These are stepping stones that I could shift to. So effectively, it's, it's rather like you're crossing a sort of very marshy area with hidden bear, bear traps. And it tells you where not to go, and it tells you where it might make sense to go and where you should be, express more caution. But it can't tell you a precise pathway. You have to discover that through action. And that's what a fitness landscape does. And, and the, the shallow places, is there a, a positive and negative aspect to shallow versus deep? Or is that context sensitive? It's context sensitive. If it's, if it's shallow and bad, that's good news because you can get things out of it. Um, if it's shallow and good, that's bad news because the energy can dissipate very quickly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What other ideas do you have for our listening audience about recentering our practice as agile thinkers? Well, we're doing a few things. Um, we're working with Gaping Void. If you know the cartoon cartoonists, yeah. They're, well, they're not cartoonists; they're illustrators. Sorry. Um, I mean, we just worked with them. We had about 60 agile people on the phone on Sunday working through a series of archetypal images. And we're about to produce a culture war of 50 agile images um, using illustrators as an art form. That will be released in a few weeks' time. We're then allowing people, for example, to, to make, present those to every one of their agile team, get the agile team to choose the one which most represents the culture, tell a story about that, and then for that we draw a fitness landscape which illustrates the culture of the organization and how it can be changed. So we don't say this is what the culture should be. We say this is what it is and how we can shift it. Yeah? Another example of the same technique is we're about to launch something to measure cognitive diversity in a company. So if everybody thinks the same and everything is aligned, despite what a lot of agile consultants will tell you, that's a total disaster for resilience. Yeah? What you need is coherence but difference, right. Right? not conformance. So if everybody has the same values, your organization is going to vanish. Right. 
Or, or it turns into a zombie organization where people are just going through the motions following the recipe. Um, I think the key thing is to understand, I mean, cognitive diversity is key also for programmers, because if they look at their cognitive diversity map against a map of the users, they'll see why they're misunderstanding them, because they see the world in a different way. And then once people can see things, they can do something about it. And that's where visualization comes in. The ability to see patterns, not have them explained to you, is really powerful. Yeah, and and um, the story and the narrative. I'm giving a talk in a couple of weeks in Agile 2018, um, and and I may regret the following statement since you're such a wonderful debater. Happiness is not a goal. It's called Soma. If you've ever read Aldo Saxley's Brave New World, yeah. If in doubt, take Soma. If in doubt, go on a happiness course. For me. When I coach teams, I'm not looking for happiness. I'm looking for health and resilience. And, and some of the things that I'm exploring is are, are ways to try to visualize that in the team. Spotify has a health check model. There's a dozen other ones. Um, the goal is not happiness, but it is health and well-being and resilience. It's no coincidence that most people go and watch tragedies, not um comedies we learn more through tragedy we learn more through failure absolutely we're trying to create systems which learn and happy systems don't learn they're complacent agreed but do you think that health and well-being um, not necessarily happiness creates that system that is tolerant of failure and learning i think well-being has become an abused word right over the last five or six years it's become a sort of it's replaced cognitive behavioral therapy as a way of suppressing symptoms and not dealing with root causes. Yeah. Yeah. I go on a wellness course you know, and everything will be fine. I mean, we did some work on um, firefighters and police um, firearm squads, and we found the main cause of mental breakdown wasn't the stress of the job. It was the health and safety regulations. And the management just wanted to put people through well-being courses so that they stopped complaining. All right? And you're seeing that extensively. I think I would, a system which is curious is, is what you want. Yeah? And cognitively diverse systems are curious, and people from that can become coherent. Mm. And the trouble is, if you start to lay down laws about what it's like appreciative inquiry, the original Coot Rider stuff was brilliant. But then it became, we can only tell positive stories. Well, at that point, you destroy diversity in learning. Yeah, um, I'm with you there. So we're coming up on time, and there's one topic that I want to make sure we don't miss, as well as giving you opportunity to tell us more upcoming events. It's the infamous coffee alcohol cycle that we love so much. <laughs> yeah, that was the one when IBM took us over. You want that story, do you? <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? Take a minute and, and, and share it, because um, many an organization probably goes through the same trauma. We, we, we were an Anglo-Dutch systems house, all right? And IBM took us over. It was like three days from start to finish. It was very scary, right? And um, the first thing they did was to charge us for coffee and ban alcohol, right? No, that's completely unreasonable, right? Ridiculous. Nobody should be expected to speak to users without alcohol. First, you then need coffee to sober up. <laughs> then you need even more alcohol because the users don't want what you, they, you can prove they want. They said they want it, right? Um, and that sort of destroyed, I mean, it was quite interesting. All the Dutch left within the first six months. The British were polite and waited a year, all right? But that's just cultural differences. <laughs> um, then it got even more ridiculous in that they, we found ways around that. You know, that was easy. But then it got more ridiculous because they banned us for buying food for staff. And by that time, we learned the only way to get them to change was to use a Socratic technique. That means you ask people questions till they contradict themselves. <laughs> Which just pisses them off. Well, it does, and Socrates, you know, eventually the people of Athens voted for him to commit suicide because they got fed up of it, all right? You could accuse of corrupting the young, right? Personally, I think the sooner you corrupt the young, the better, but that's another matter. So um, we went along and said, look, you know, I said the other week, and I was called out at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm a duty executive. I'm now C-level, so I only see unhappy customers. You know, the higher you get promoted, the worse it gets. And I said, we've got a VAX cluster down, a 999 service, which won't be up first thing in the morning. The only thing I can do is keep people off their backs so they solve the problem and buy them pizza and coke so they stay awake yeah. so what do i do and they looked slightly worried and i realized they could have misinterpreted so i said if you do mean coca-cola and you know they sigh of relief at that point right? 
And then they said, okay, we understand this. Um, if you get vice presidential approval 48 hours in advance, you can do it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. At this point, you just breathe slowly. Remember the Socratic technique. So that's, that's brilliant. That's one of the major advantages of joining IBM. We'd never have thought of that, all right? And then you read irony is a deadly weapon, right? And we said, what happens on the very rare occasion where we don't get 48 hours notice of a major crisis? And then they said, okay, country general manager approval after the event. Now, the net result of that is you know your expenses will never be signed. They'll just disappear into the South Bank, yeah, and they'll never come back. And if you complain, your name will appear on the wrong sorts of lists. So the practice emerged of over-tipping London taxi drivers, which means you get a blank receipt. The blank receipt was filled out for the amount of pizza and Coke bought. I hasten to I would, of course, never do this. I just heard about other people doing it. Of course. The manager would then take a bus and claim for the taxi. Now, I gave that story at the Scrum Alliance conference in Berlin a couple of years back. Three people from IBM ran up to me afterwards and showed them their wallets full of blank receipts, but we're still doing it. <laughs> it's a classic example of an overstructured system produces the exact opposite of what it, what it was intended. Oh, it's beautiful. I love the story. Seven years of IBM, I've got lots of stories, good and bad. I mean, I, IBM is a bit like the Catholic Church. You never quite get it out of your blood. Yeah, it was the best of times and the worst of times, to put it differently. Such a cultural change mm-hmm. and a clash. Um, so we're, we're coming up at the end of the time box. What have you got coming up in uh, the next couple of weeks, a month? You mentioned, um, and I'll get a link from you, uh, some of the illustration work that you're doing. That'll be wonderful to see and share out. We're going to push that out in the next couple of weeks. They're called Pulses. So we can look at attitudes to cybersecurity, culture mapping, and cognitive diversity. So those are coming out. We just completed a big one-day session at Whistler in Canada looking at a complexity-based alternative to design thinking. That will be published shortly. If anybody's interested, we're looking at resilience in systems in Tasmania mid-August over a five-day retreat format. That's front edge development, and then we're looking at value and behavioral change in Snowdonia in October. And then we got several master classes. I'm running some with Simon Wardley to map Kinevin in with um, Wardley Maps, and we're going to link Kinevin with it, with UDA and Kinevin with Theory of Constraints. So there'll be master classes on those announced uh, on three continents over the next week. What's the best way for our listeners to get in touch with you and find some more information about the Website, Cognitive Edge has got it. I blog. Well, not as frequently as I should because we're in the middle of a merger at the moment, but I'll be back to daily and blogging shortly. Or just ping me on the website and that will get through to me. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Professor Snowden, for your time. Pleasure. And to you, our listening audience, if you enjoyed this episode, give us a review or a rating in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast platform of choice. It really helps others find us. If this is your first time tuning in, subscribe. Catch the next one. Finally, if you'd like to join the discussion, share your stories about chaos, complexity, coffee, and alcohol, join us at the coalition.agileuprising.com website. Until next time, this is the Agile Uprising podcast, signing out. Mm -hmm.